Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, may I uh, just right in the beginning, before we all forget, uh, remind you all to uh, switch your mobile phones off so that uh, Walter is not disturbed while she speaks. But you know, it's a normal announcement we make these days. So I'm uh, Jamshid Godridge. Uh, I'm the chairman emeritus of the Aspen Institute uh, in India. Uh, the Aspen Institute India has been uh, around for about six years, but our association with the Aspen Institute uh, uh, from CII has been there for a very long time, more than 20 years. And so I'm very pleased uh, that we have with us today uh, <clears throat> Walter Isaacson, who is the president and CEO of the Aspen Institute uh, in the US. As you all probably know, uh, the Aspen Institute uh, in the US is a nonpartisan educational and policy studies institute, which is based in Washington, DC. But as you can imagine and guess from the name, Aspen has a wonderful campus in Aspen, Colorado. And for those of you who haven't had an opportunity to do so, someday you should do that. Walter. Uh, you know, before he became uh, president and CEO uh, of the Aspen Institute uh, uh, in the US, he has uh, had a wonderful uh, career. Uh, he's been the chairman and CEO of CNN, and also he's been the editor of Time Magazine. And uh, so I think that uh, for Indian audiences uh, who've known about CNN and Time here, I think it's also wonderful uh, Walter, that uh, that connection uh, continues here. And uh, he has authored many books. We are here today to listen to uh, Walter on his latest book, which is on uh, Steve Jobs. And, uh, but he has also written books uh, on uh, Einstein, uh, on Benjamin Franklin, and on Kissinger. And another book which he co-authored, which is The Wise Men. Six Friends and the World They Made. And uh, Isaac, uh, uh, Walter has, uh, uh, is a graduate of uh, Harvard College, and he's been at Pembroke College at Oxford University, and where he was a Rhodes Scholar. And he began his career actually uh, in London uh, with the Sunday Times. And he's had a wonderful uh, career, as I said, uh, first uh, with uh, Time Magazine, and then with CNN, and he's been the CEO of Aspen Institute since 2003. He's also uh, the chairman of uh, Teach for America, and that's also very interesting, Aspen, because we, uh, yeah, Walter, because you know we have Teach for India now, and which has uh, become quite a large and successful uh, program, and so that's uh, something really important uh, for us too, and. Uh, uh, very interestingly, Walter is also uh, appointed by President Barack Obama to serve as the chairman of the Broadcasting Board of Governors, which oversees uh, the Voice of America and uh, Radio Free Europe and uh, other uh, uh, international broadcasts from the United States. And I think that he held that position till very recently. Uh, he's also the vice chair uh, of the Partners for a New Beginning which is a public-private uh, group tasked with forging ties between the United States and the Muslim world. And uh, this, I think, is, is uh, not just very important for us uh, in India, but I think it's from a global uh, point of view, this is a crucial uh, matter for us. And he's also on the board of uh, United Airlines, Tulane University, and on the board of the overseas of, overseers of uh, Harvard University. And interestingly, uh, uh, he's also uh, been connected with uh, the relief work uh, after Hurricane Katrina, where he chaired the Louisiana Recovery Authority. So Walter is, uh, uh, has had a wonderful uh, career. Uh, the Aspen Institute under his leadership has achieved great heights, and we are very proud uh, that the Aspen Institute India can uh, host uh, Walter and the entire international uh, board uh, of, uh, of the Aspen Institute who are here with us, and we had a wonderful seminar this morning. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, I would like to also on behalf of uh, the publisher of the book, Rahashit uh, India, uh, welcome you all.
to this uh, talk uh, by Walter Isaacson, and I hope you not only enjoy the talk, but that it will be something uh, that you'll be able to ask him a few questions for at the end. So thank you very much for being here, and may I now ask Walter to speak. Thank you very much, Jamshid, and thank you very much for hosting uh, the International Aspen Partners from around the world at a wonderful meeting this morning. It's great for all of us to be here with our partners at the Aspen Institute India, and I use the word partner very carefully because the Aspen Institutes around the world, there are eight of them, are all equal partners in a network. Uh, some people sometimes think that a group like Aspen Institute India is some affiliate or subsidiary of an American organization, but actually we are all partners in one organization, and Aspen Institute India, which is thriving, thanks to you and uh, Kiran and others, uh, is an independent organization, raises its own money, chooses its own programming, and uh, we learn a lot at the Aspen Institute US from how well you do at the Aspen Institute India. And um, it's just an honor to be in part of a network and a partnership with you. Um, I started writing this book when I got a phone call from Steve Jobs right after I came to the Aspen Institute in the United States. I had known Steve for quite a while. Uh, I had been at Time Magazine and CNN. I first met him in 1984 when he came by Time Magazine to show off this new computer, the computer that felt like an appliance, a beautiful device called the Macintosh. If you have the book and you look on the back cover of the book, or the back jacket, there he is sitting in the lotus position, which he learned in India, holding and cradling the Mac from 1984. I was about the only writer at Time Magazine who used the computer, so all the old editors at Time who were meeting with Steve Jobs made me come up so that they could have somebody there who knew what a computer actually was. And I remember being totally blown away, totally impressed by Steve Jobs. First of all, he had a passion for his product, a passion for the beauty of it and the perfection of it. He made us look at how wonderfully shaped the case was, how sealed like an appliance it was, each curve on it, how the disk drive at the bottom was slightly off center so it looked like a human face with a little bit of a smile. And the icons on the screen, he made us use a jeweler's loop to look at each of the pixels and see how beautiful they were. But I also saw that that passion and intensity of Steve Jobs was reflected in sort of an impatience and a real roughness to his character. Because partway through the meeting, he informed those of us at Time Magazine that our magazine was not nearly as good as Newsweek, that they understood things much better than we did, and that uh, our magazine, to use a phrase that he sometimes used, well, I won't use that phrase, <laughs> but it was a somewhat uh, shocking phrase to some of the older colleagues in my editorial uh, uh, team. And it was because he thought we were going to make him man of the year the year before. And when we hadn't made him man of the year, he was quite upset. So I saw that sort of intensity that was translated into a passion for his products, but also into an impatience and a petulance. Uh, and over the years, I knew Steve Jobs moderately well. When I became editor of Time Magazine and then the head of CNN, he was actually my best friend uh, two days a year whenever he had a new product out. He would come and show it and tell us why it should be on the cover of Time Magazine or featured on CNN. So after I came to the Aspen Institute uh, early in 2004, he gave me a call. I said, why don't you come speak at the Institute? He said, well, I'll come, but I don't want to speak. I want to take a walk with you. I did not know that taking a walk was Steve's way of having a meeting. I had just, uh, I had written a biography of Benjamin Franklin, as John Sheed mentioned. I was just about to publish a biography of Albert Einstein. And so Steve said to me, why don't you do my biography next? I must admit, my first reaction was, 
Benjamin Franklin, Albert Einstein, you. The humility that you showed back in 1984 is still intact. Um, and so I said, uh, yes, I'd love to, but let's wait 20 or 30 years until you retire. Eventually, his wife and others said to me, you know, if you're going to do a biography of Steve, you, ought, you have to do it now. You've got to do it now. I said, well, I did not know that he had cancer when he called me. I did not know he was sick. His wife said, well, nobody knew. He was keeping it a complete secret but he called you the day before he was about to be operated on. And I realized that, you know, here was a guy facing mortality, and I thought about his place in history. And he was somebody, it occurred to me, who really represented the entrepreneurial creation myth writ large. Somebody who had started a company in his parents' garage, with the chubby kid from down the street, and turned it into the most valuable company on the planet. Secondly, he, uh, it was a great restoration drama for those of us who like narrative story arcs. A guy who gets kicked out of his own company in 1985, a year after that Mac was created, gets kicked out of his own company, but 12 years later they have to bring him back because the company is going bankrupt and he saves the company. And also, he had basically transformed a dozen industries, starting with the home computer industry. That Macintosh I mentioned that's on the back of the book, that was the first computer that said, oh, you can bring me home. This is not just for the Pentagon or a big corporation. These are home computers, personal computers, ones you can use. He also transformed the music industry, the publishing industry, the cell phone industry, the retail store industry, the digital movie animation industry. All of these were transformed by that passion for product that uh, I saw when I had first met Steve. So I said, sure, I'd be very interested in doing this. And we talked about the various things that made his life what it was. First of all, he told me that he had traveled to India when he was a dropout from college. Drops out, comes here for almost a year, wandering around penniless, looking for spiritual enlightenment, living in the villages of India. I asked him what he learned here. He said, first of all, the value of intuition. He said, you know, where I grew up, we believed in Western rational thought, empirical thinking. But I learned in the villages of India the importance of intuition of experiential wisdom, of focusing and understanding the simplicity that comes from that experiential wisdom and that intuition you ha have. Secondly, he talked about the importance of connecting beauty to science. He said he really learned the importance of art and beauty and style and design and how that connected to engineering, technology, business, uh, and the creation of product. And uh, so that to me was the main thing underlying Steve's great passion for the products he made. Uh, I first saw him describe that passion for product, which I think is his most salient trait, when he was a young kid. I mean, when he talked about being a young kid. We walked around the neighborhood where he grew up. We walked around the house when he was a five, six, seven, eight years old. And he said, when I was a young kid, we built this fence. And he made me look at the fence around the house. And he made me go to the back of the fence. And he said, my father told me that we had to make the back of the fence just as beautiful as the front of the fence. And Steve said, why? Nobody will ever see it. Nobody will ever know. And his father said, yes, but you will know. And Steve said, that was the first lesson I had in the importance of making a great product, was that if you care about putting everything together and integrating it so that it's a perfect product, 
If you have that true artistic sensibility, then you're going to care even about the parts that are unseen. He said his father, who was just a dropout, an auto mechanic, dropped out of high school, said when you're a craftsman and you make a great chest of drawers, you don't put a cheap piece of wood on the back facing the wall, even though nobody will ever see it. If you're a true craftsman, you put a good piece of wood there because that shows you're a true artist. And so when they were building that first Macintosh, um, Steve sort of loved everything about it, as I said, the sealed case, how beautiful it was. But right as they were getting near the end, Steve looked at the circuit board, and he said to the engineers making the circuit board, this is ugly. Uh, this stinks. Actually, he used a stronger word than stinks. They said, what do you mean? They said, well, you know, the chips aren't lined up. They're not beautiful. They're not equally spaced. And they said, but Steve, you have this in a sealed appliance. Nobody can open up the case. Nobody will ever see it. Nobody will ever know. And Steve said what his father had said to him. Yes, but you will know. And so they held up shipping the original Macintosh until they perfected that circuit board and made it beautiful made it so all the chips were spaced equally. And when they did, Steve had all 32 engineers on the Macintosh team sign a whiteboard with their names, with Stephen P. Jobs, all in lowercase, signed right in the middle, so that they could engrave the names on the inside of that Macintosh case. Because what he said to them is, real artists sign their work. Real artists take a passion for product. Those of you in business know that you have two real ways of approaching a business. One is to have a passion for the product, making the product as insanely great, to use Steve's words, as possible. And another way is having a passion for making a profit. And they're both valid ways, but Steve said, if you have a passion mainly for making a profit, you will end up cutting corners on the product. You'll make it a little bit cheaper. You'll uh, make it a little bit easier. And eventually, you won't have a really great product, and you'll just be a commodity like everybody else. But if you have a passion for the product, and you do everything you can to make it a beautiful product you're proud of, eventually, the profits will follow. And over and over again, Steve had that wonderful passion for even the parts unseen, making them as perfect as possible. Part of that passion translated into what uh, some of the people worked with him called a reality distortion field. I'm not sure they always meant it as a compliment. Uh, some of you may know that it's a phrase from uh, the early Star Trek episodes where the aliens, when they want to conjure up a galaxy, do it through sheer force of will. They make something happen that seems impossible simply by willing it to be so. And Steve sometimes was able to do that. Uh, his first partner, the kid from down the street I mentioned, was Steve Wozniak. And early on, before they started a company together, they worked on the night shift at Apple. Actually, Steve Jobs was the one who had the main job on the night shift of Apple. I mean, at Atari, not at Apple. Uh, Atari, which was a video game maker. And the reason he worked, by the way, on the night shift at Atari is he had gotten the job right when he had come back from India after spending almost a year in India. Wearing his saffron robes, he walks in to the lobby of Atari and demands a job. Uh, as Al Alcorn, the chief engineer of Atari, explained it to me, he said, having come back from India and having met his guru, He'd become a strict vegan. He only ate fruits and vegetables. And he believed that if you kept to such a diet, you actually did not need to shower often or use deodorant. <laughs> and Al Alcorn looked at me and said, that was a mistaken theory. <laughs> so anyway, Steve, with his strong personality and even stronger, um, well, whatever, um, gets put on the night shift and they're creating video games. And one of them is a game 
that Al Alcorn wanted them to do called Breakout, which was like the game Pong, which is a two-player game where you nick, knock a blip back and forth. But it was going to be a one-player game called Breakout. And Steve Jobs says to Wozniak, you have to design this and do the engineering, do the software for it in four days. And Woz says, well, no, no, it actually is a pretty complicated bit of uh, coding. It'll take me about three weeks. And Steve said, no, no, you have to do it in four days. We have to get back to the Apple com commune, the farm they were working on, uh, hence the name of the company they eventually founded. But the harvest was coming along, and Jobs said, you've got to do it in four days, and Woz keeps protesting. Steve had learned at an early age as he's studying Eastern religions and trying to make himself mystical, how to stare without blinking. And Waz said, he just sat right across from me and stared without blinking and said, don't be afraid, you can do it. <laughs> Waz said, I kept praying, he said, don't be afraid, you can do it. Waz finally said, so I went back to my little desk and I stayed up four nights in a row, and I was able to code the entire breakout game. That's an example of Steve Jobs' reality distortion field, which drove people crazy and drove them to distraction, but also drove them to do things they thought were impossible. Over and over again, you see this in Jobs' career. For example, when they're doing that a Macintosh that I keep talking about, the beautiful machine he made early on, uh, it took, in the prototype, about 78 seconds to boot up. It was really slow in booting up. It was almost as bad as a Microsoft uh, machine. And so Steve says to Larry Kenyon, the engineer in charge of the boot-up sequence, you've got to shave 10 seconds off the boot-up sequence. Kenyon says, no, there's no way. This is an elegant piece of code, Steve. It can't. And Kenyon said, he just sat there and stared at me and said, don't be afraid, you can do it. <laughs> Finally, uh, Kenyon relents, goes back. He said, I went back to my cubicle, took me a couple of weeks, but I shaved 28 seconds off the boot up time. Over and over again, you see Steve doing this. One of my, my fi final example of this uh, concerns the iPhone. When Jobs was coming up with the notion of doing an iPhone, he didn't want it to have, like other cell phones, a junky piece of plastic as its face. He wanted the face of the iPhone to be silky glass, to be really tough and smooth and smudge-resistant form of glass. And the claves that were making the glass for the stores in China would send samples, and they weren't good enough. They didn't meet Steve's high standards. So finally, somebody said, why don't you call Corning Glass? So Steve, being Steve, picks up the phone and calls a switchboard at Corning and says, let me speak to your CEO. And the switchboard, being a typical switchboard, said, fine, we'll take your name and number. We'll have somebody call you back. Steve slams down the phone, says, you know, typ typical East Coast bull. Uh, so the guy who's the CEO of Corning hears about this, and being a cool guy, he picks up the phone, calls the Apple switchboard in Cupertino and says, let me speak to your CEO. And uh, the switchboard in Cupertino says, We'll put your request in writing and fax it to us. <laughs> so when Steve Jobs heard that story, he said, that's my type of guy. So he meets with Wendell Weeks. Uh, this is in, you know, when they're doing the iPhone, 2003, 2004. And he explains what he wants out of this glass. And Wendell Weeks said, you know, years ago we had a process we created that was an ion transfer process that made something we called Gorilla Glass. We never manufactured it, but it was exactly what you want. Steve looked at the process, went through the chemical uh, relationships, and then said to Wendell Weeks, the CEO, that's it. I want it. And I need this much by September, because we're shipping the phones in late October. You have to make all this glass by September. And of course, Weeks said, no, no. I just told you, we've never made this glass before. We can't make it by September. Well, you may know how the story will evolve. <laughs> I actually went to Corning, New York, because I wanted to meet Wendell Weeks and hear this story from him. And he said, the guy just sat right across from me. <laughs> and he stared at me without blinking. Now, by the way, this is 30 years almost to the month that he had done it to Wozniak in the Atari 
breakout game. And Wendell Weeks says, he just kept saying, don't be afraid, you can do it. Don't be afraid, you can do it. And Weeks said when he left, when Jobs left, Weeks called up a plant man manager near Lexington, Kentucky at a corning plant there that was making flat screen television sets and said to him, I want you to switch right away to making Gorilla Glass. And of course the manager said, well, I'll try, but you know, it's going to take a while. We, we, you know, and we can't really do it now because we don't have the equipment and we don't have the whole process. And Weeks basically just said to him, don't be afraid, you can do it. <laughs> and the upshot is, that's why every piece of glass on your iPhone that year and every year since then, including the iPhone 5, and every piece of glass that's the cover of the iPad is made by Corning Glass because of Steve's reality distortion field. He made people believe they could do things that they thought impossible. One of the other things he did uh, that I think was a great trait was believe in the virtue of simplicity. The very first Apple marketing brochure had the headline, Simplicity is the Ultimate Sophistication. He believed, as Newton did, as Einstein did, as many great scientists did, that simplicity was a form of beauty, was the way an elegant universe was created. And he said that he got that, that notion of simplicity and beauty from his study of Buddhism, Zen Buddhism, Eastern religions, and he always believed that he had to make every device as simple as possible. It probably started back in those days when he and Waz were working the night shift at Atari Video Games. Those of you who remember the Atari games, remember that they kind of had to be simple enough that a stoned freshman could figure them out after midnight they didn't have any instructions. It was just sort of insert quarter, avoid Klingons, and it was all intuitive. That intuition, that intuitive feel that he said he learned from his travels here. And so everything that he did, there were no manuals, no instructions for the iPod, the iPhone, or whatever. It was all supposed to be intuitive, simple interfaces. For example, when he's doing the first iPod, there were really many, many other companies that had done MP3 music players. But they were all rather brain dead. They were all rather complicated. You could never quite figure out how do you get all your songs into the music player? How do you find the song you want? How do you go through that silly menu of things and sort of keep clicking and try to figure out how to get there? So Steve said, here is what we're going to make. It's going to be just this simple. No manual, no instructions, just a thousand songs in your pocket and three clicks to get to any song you want. So the interface designers worked and they tried and they'd show them things. They'd say, well, it takes, you have to do a little bit more than three clicks because we need to have something that says the album and the, oh, he said, no, why do you need all that? Three clicks, get me to the song. If you can't get me where I want in three clicks, not going to approve it. So they finally come up with that beautiful scroll wheel, as you know, on the original iPod. Just gorgeous. It's intuitive. You know exactly how to make it turn around. You know exactly what to hit to go play or stop. You know how to get to any song you want. And Steve finds it beautiful, simple, elegant. But he looks at the iPod that they've done, and there's a big button right on top of it. And Steve says, what the is this? Pointing to the button. And, uh, you know, the engineer's a little bit wary because they know he knows what it is. They finally say, well, that's the on-off button, Steve. And he says, what the does it do? They're a little bit wary. Then finally, somebody is brave enough to say, Steve, it turns it on and off. And then Steve says, why do we need it? And of course, it dawns on them. You don't need that big old button up there. If you quit using your iPod for a while, it powers down gently. If you start using it again, it powers back up. You don't need some complicated thing that destroys the simplicity and the beauty of the design of the product. He even did that with a program called iDVD, which is for burning digital video discs. 
And uh, people had done the interface. They had all sorts of things, you know, a box on the screen, and you put in your video disc, and it had all the things you could do. It had pull-down menus. And Steve said, what's all this? And they said, well, you know, this man, and he finally stops, and he goes to his whiteboard, and he just draws a rectangle. He puts a little flame at the bottom, draws a little flame at the bottom. He says, that's it. That's all you want. You drag whatever you want into the rectangle. You push the button that says burn. Nothing else. It should just be that simple. Those of you, you know, whether you're using Microsoft Word or any other thing else, you know, all those menus and all those little things they add and all the simplicity for Steve was the heart and soul of making a sophisticated product. That, too, tied into another thing I think he learned in India and also from his uh, Buddhist and uh, religious training and Eastern religions, which was focus, to be in the moment, to always focus. People sometimes say, why didn't he do planning? Why didn't he? He would always just focus on a few things. For example, when he comes back to Apple in 1997, they've started milking the Macintosh for profit as opposed to making a good product. And when you start milking it for profit, it meant they had created all sorts of versions of the Macintosh so that they could, you know, increase the distribution chains and find new ways to uh, make money off of it. So there was the Macintosh 3600 and the 3600C or the CX and the 4600. And there were 40 different types of Macintosh computers. And Steve kept saying, why do we? And they would sort of explain the return on investment for each different model. And finally, he said, stop goes again to the whiteboard. He loved the whiteboards because it allowed him to be in control, allowed him to make people to focus. He just draws a grid, four squares, you know, a little cross like that. Home, office, he writes on the top. Laptop, desktop. He says, that's it. We're just going to make four computers. Focus. Just make four great computers. And they do. They make the iMac, the PowerBook, the, um, uh, Power Mac. And then when they do, after a few years, they finally return the company to, folk, uh, to uh, profit. Steve says, okay, we have to think about what we're going to do next. And they go on a three-day off-site, and they um, come up with all sorts of ideas. And they're all fighting to be on Steve's whiteboard, that first page of the whiteboard, of the list of the things they could be doing next. And finally, at the end of three days, they finally have uh, fought to get those ten things that made it on the first page of the whiteboard. And then Steve takes a marker and crosses out the bottom seven and says, focus, focus. We can only focus on three. That's why you have the iPhone, the iPod, and the iPad. That sense of direct focus. And above all, it was that sense of intuition, that emotional feeling to know through experiential wisdom what people wanted. When they were building the first Mac, one of the engineers said, don't we need a focus group? Don't we need market research and a focus group to find out what people might want in this machine? And he said, how do people know what they want in the machine until we've told them what they want, until we've shown them what they want? He didn't believe in doing focus groups and market research. He believed in intuition and knowing what a customer would want through your experiential wisdom. He used to cite the old Henry Ford line, who said, um, if I'd asked a focus group what people wanted, they would have said a faster horse. So Steve uses intuition, that sense of here's what will emotionally connect to people throughout his career. Uh, one example that I love is when he comes back in 1997 and he makes what's called the iMac. I don't know if you remember the iMac, but it sort of had a playful shape. It looked like a rabbit almost that had just hopped on your desk with a beyondy blue, translucent blue cover. It was translucent so you could see inside. And one of the reasons you could do it, you could look inside sort of, and you saw for the first time that beautiful circuit board, perfectly designed really good-looking circuit board. And it showed how the technology comes up and connects to the beauty, almost symbolically with it. 
But he and Johnny Ive, the great industrial designer at Apple, as they're designing it, Johnny Ive puts in a little recessed handle on top of it. And uh, the engineers and the people manufacturing it at Apple say, well, this handle will be sort of costly and it's ridiculous. This is a desktop computer. People aren't going to carry it around. We don't need a recessed handle when you open it up and see it. And what Johnny Ive explained and what Steve Jobs intuitively understood, he said, you know, people are afraid of computers. My mom is afraid of computers. But if you open the box and you see a little handle, or you walk up to the machine and there's that handle there, even if you're never going to use that handle, it sort of sends a signal to you. It says, you can touch me. Go ahead, touch me. I'm at your service. I work for you. I defer to you. And it was that intuition that sort of knew things of how to put in a handle that would simply make the machine look like it deferred to you. Uh, about a, you know, a little over a year ago when he was very ill and uh, you know, it wasn't clear he was going to make it, I asked him about his legacy. The end of my book, most biographies, a biographer has the last word and writes the last chapter and says what you should think. But the last six or seven pages of my book is just Steve talking. Because every, I got him to talk many times about his legacy and I realized that I wouldn't be doing a good book on Steve Jobs if I didn't just get out of the way and let Steve sort of have those last words. So he talked quite a bit about his legacy. One of the things he told me, I uh, said, what maxims do you live by? He said, I love the Whole Earth Catalog. Those of you who remember the Whole Earth Catalog with the picture of the Earth up front, Stuart Brand created it. But the very final edition of the Whole Earth Catalog, which Steve brought with him when he traveled to college and to India and every place else, that last edition on the very back cover just had a picture of a road, one of those types of road in a village that you'd stumble across if you were hitchhiking anywhere in this world. And all it said was stay hungry, stay foolish. It really meant that you always had to be willing to try things to think different, as he said, to think outside of your comfort zone, to be imaginative. And I asked him about that type of legacy, and I said, you know, is that how you want? He said, you know, in history, one of the things I learned from my Buddhist training is that we're on a journey and that the journey is the reward. That history is a great flow and you take things out of the flow of history that becomes things that you use, services you use, ways of doing things that people before you have invented and put into the flow of history. And so you too, in your life, you should judge yourself, not by how much money you make or other forms of success, but what useful you're able to create and put back into the flow of history. And that's what I always tried to do, is say, these products are really good. It may not be, you know, the biggest inventions in the world, but over and over again, it's putting something cool, a thousand songs in your pocket, a machine you could touch, whatever it may be, back into the flow of history. So I said, what was your most satisfying, your greatest uh, product? And he said, um, I thought he was going to say the iPhone or the iPad or whatever it may be. He said, you know, lots of people make products. And it's hard to make a good product. But what's really hard is to make a company that continues to make good products over and over again. And so my most important creation, I think, was Apple because it's a place that will always connect beauty to engineering. Uh, it was just over a year ago when he went to his last board meeting to offer his letter, stepping down as CEO. A uh, beautiful letter that said that day has come, about the time for him to step down. And they were all kind of joking at the meeting afterwards, trying to jolly him up, trying to make everybody feel a little bit better, because they knew how sick he was. And they made fun of Hewlett Packard, which had just gotten out of the um, tablet computing business that very morning. And Steve said, wait a minute, stop. Bill Hewlett gave me my first job. When I was 13 years old, I called him in the phone book, and he gave me a summer job. And he and David Packard, in their garage, thought they had made a company 
that would last for generations. Not just a good product, not just a good frequency counters and measurable scopes and then finally calculators and then computers. They thought they had made a company that would always innovate. And then these bozos that are running it now screw it up. Don't let that happen to Apple. And I think he felt that at the end he had ingrained in Apple's DNA that connection of beauty and technology that would lay, leave an enduring company. And finally, I said to him, you know, based on your travels, your visit to India, your feeling about Buddhism and Eastern religions, I said, do you um, still believe uh, in, uh, in the spirituality of that, in God? Do you believe that after you die, your spirit lives on, your consciousness will live on? He said, I like to believe that. I really do. And most of the time, I do believe that, that your spirit lives on, that your experiential wisdom is part of a consciousness that survives. He said, but then, of course, sometimes I despair, and I think, well, maybe it's just like an on-off switch. You die, and click, you're gone. I was taken aback, <laughs> and I looked at him, and then he gave me that half smile that he sometimes gave. He said, maybe that's why I didn't like to put on-off switches on Apple devices. Anyway, I hope I give, that gives you a sense of Steve Jobs, his passion for creation, and what he thought his legacy was. Thank you all very much. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Walter. That was uh, a really wonderful uh, talk. And it's such a good flavor of the book, and uh, I think uh, just for your information, the book is on sale in the in the room uh, next door. And uh, if you're really nice to Walter, I'm sure you'll sign a few of them. And uh, but uh, right now uh, we have some time to uh, ask some questions or some comments. And uh, so, we're, since we are short of time, please keep your questions and comments really short. And it'd be nice if you could just give your name before you uh, speak. So right in the beginning, we have, yeah. I'm Arvinda Brara, Chairman and Managing Director of Mantec Consultants. Very fascinating what you said. My question is, uh, comparison between Microsoft and Apple, yeah. Uh, we do understand from what you've said the difference, but would you elaborate with your own Yeah, uh, the, the difference between Microsoft and Apple, and for that matter, Steve Jobs and Bill Gates, which is a theme in the book, and near the end, uh, they both talk about it. But there was a basic fundamental difference of philosophy that is at the core of the digital age, which is Steve Jobs' belief in integrated systems, end-to-end -end control, where the hardware, the software, and the content are all integrated into a tightly knit system and product versus the Microsoft and Bill Gates way, which is a more open thing where the software, such as Windows, can be licensed to other hardware makers. That gives you a chance for much more innovation. If Hewlett Packard and Dell and Lenovo and IBM all licensing your software and different people are making hardware for it, on the other hand, it doesn't allow for as beautiful of an end-to-end -end controlled experience, which is what the Steve Jobs model of end-to-end -end integration is. You see that have played out over the years in the digital age and is playing out now again with the Apple, oper uh, the iOS operating system on the iPhone and the iPad, which is tightly integrated to the hardware versus the Android operating system by Google which, like Microsoft's Windows, is licensed out to many uh, hardware makers. And so that was a deep difference in philosophy that reflected a difference in personality between the two people, which is Bill Gates was the better businessman, you know, willing to try different things. Steve Jobs was the better artist, the person of real taste, who wanted to control the whole experience because a real artist doesn't allow other people to make brush strokes on his canvas or whatever it might be. Um, at uh, one point um, near the end, Bill Gates wanted to visit Steve. This was about a year and a half ago, last, it was last summer, 
Steve was very ill. Steve is not that gracious, but they had known each other, obviously, since the 1970s when Microsoft was writing Word for Apple II. Uh, and uh, Steve, you know, says, oh, he just wants to make up to me, you know, after all these years because he knows I'm sick. Uh, but Bill just comes to the back door of Steve's house in Palo Alto, knocks on the door, and they talk for about three hours. And Bill Gates says to Steve Jobs, you know, I never thought that your model of end-to-end -end integrated control would work, but you proved it could work, which was a nice thing of Bill to say. And Steve, who, as I said, is not always quite as gracious, says to Bill Gates, well, you proved your model could work as well. Now, I was around, and I hear these tales from both of them, and I think, oh, this is a beautiful ending of the book. Sun is setting, violins are playing, the two great rivals make up, and they both say the models work. So then Bill says to me when I'm talking to him about it, he says, what I didn't tell Steve is his model works, but it only works really well when you have a great artist like Steve in control of it, somebody with a real artist sensibility. Uh, and so I thought, well, that'll make Steve feel good. So I tell Steve that later. And instead of feeling good, Steve looks up and he says, what an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> he said, Bill could have made that work. Bill could have made that model work, but he didn't make it work because he has no taste, you know. <laughs> and I said, but you said his model worked just as well, the open model where you license it out. He said, sure, his model works too if all you care about is making a profit. But if you don't care about making crappy products, that's all he made was crappy products. So anyway, that's a sense of one of the great rivalries, but also respects. I mean, there was an odd bonding between those two people, and they really defined the birth of the uh, home computer aid. Gentleman at the back. I'll be shorter in my answers, sorry. Yeah, it's right there. <clears throat> I'm Yenil Chopra, a war veteran. Uh, this India and cancer, since he was afflicted with cancer, we have this belief, faith, destiny, mm. and a positive attitude which carries us through. And I'm talking of my own family, personally. Now, Steve, he had this cancer. He was a perfectionist. He believed in so many things. What, did he, what, were, his, what were his feelings regarding this cancer? And especially he had first in the light of took what his you said, cancer. That in the light of what you said, that uh, switch on, switch off. He at Thank first you. approached his cancer in two ways, which Steve always did. The rebel counterculture way in which he thought he could treat it macrobiotically and holistically and with a vegan diet. But he also then had his genes sequenced and um, did a whole lot of targeted therapies. So as usual with Steve, it was both approaches, sort of that rebel countercultural approach and the very uh, button-down scientific approach. It took him a while before he had the operation. Uh, probably would have been smarter to have it sooner, although we don't know whether it would have affected the cancer. This young man here. The mic's right next to you. Uh, really loved your talk. And Just my introduce yourself. I'm Samyak. And my question to you is that, did you ever come under the influence of the reality distortion field yourself? Yeah, <laughs> uh, well, you have to read the book and see if I got caught in the reality distortion field. I'm sure I did. Uh, I like Steve. I respect Steve, even though if you read the book, you realize he was pretty tough at times. Um, in the end, I found myself admiring him, being awed by him, which probably meant I was caught in the reality distortion field. Yes, this gentleman here, yes. My name is Krishan Kalra. My short question is about a contradiction that I noticed in the personality of Steve Jobs. All of us have contradictions in him. Here was a man who was with a passion for perfection, for beauty, and for the product. Impossible deadlines he made. He was also deeply spiritual, in addition to what you said about his visit to India. I read this article in the Economic Times this morning, which talked about his being deeply spiritual. And yet, the guy did not believe in, uh, in, 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 in charity at all. He did not believe he had a craving for being the man of the year of the time cover. I find it a little odd, these two things. Yeah, I mean, the uh, issue with Steve is he's a man of very deep contradictions. If he weren't, the book wouldn't have to be 600 pages. Uh, he is a complex character. And the greatest of the contradictions is the one I mentioned. 
which is he always loved to think of him as the hippie, the misfit, the rebel, the counterculture dude. And yet, he was making a very sealed end-to-end -end product, trying to make a lot of money off of a high-end business machine, and was very, very, you know, business-oriented. Um, I think all of us embody contradictions, um, and Steve probably more so than everybody. And throughout the book, I try to show the synthesis and Hegelian dialectic that comes from the clash of his contradictions. So uh, can we have some ladies also uh, ask some questions? Uh, uh, yes, please. <laughs> is that tip? Uh, yeah. Hi, my name is Nicole Parker King. Um, in the book, you, uh, Steve tells you that um, he, he concedes that he's not sure if um, he really thinks that Tim Cook is a product guy. And I wanted to know now, after a year's time with Tim Cook being the CEO, what, would, what grade would you give him? And yeah, I actually try not. I mean, I wrote a history book and the biography of Steve Jobs. And I try not to be a commentator on, you know, what is Apple doing now? Is the iPhone 5 as beautiful as the iPhone 4? I don't go on TV and I don't make those comments. I will say of this, Steve found a team that was very loyal to him. And even though Tim Cook is not a product guy who wakes up late at night and says the chamfer curve on this case is a little too severe, we have to smooth it out, or you know something like that, what Steve had was a team that embodied all of Steve's strengths. Cook is a brilliant CEO. Johnny Ive is the best industrial designer of our day and generation. Scott Forstall, great at software. Schiller, Eddie Q. And so that team that was loyal to him for the past 10 years and is still a tight team, I think replicates to the extent that it's possible to replicate the strengths of Steve Jobs. Please introduce yourself. I'm Dr. Suman Bala, and I teach literature at University of Delhi. Um, Incidentally, this book was the book of the uh, book for our book club last month. Oh, good. Thank so you. So not only that we read it, we discussed it thoroughly. Uh, I think I read it twice, and um, you probably know this book better than I do. <laughs> <laughs> no, I enjoyed it uh, immensely, and um, you have put the man in uh, you know so many pages and one reads on and on and on and still you know steve remains an enigma you know i feel that there is so much more we want to know about this man yeah. and another thing which i thought was that the style was like that of dr johnson mm -hmm. if you Bob were well, in you mean dr samuel johnson that uh, i wrote like Johnson yeah, or like the, the way you wrote the book, and um, you know, you said you were in awe of him. Yeah. I don't think that came across yeah. through the book. Well, uh, I think you might mean Boswell, who wrote the life of Johnson, and I do, uh, since I don't think anybody ever reads Dr. Johnson, they only read Boswell on the life of Johnson. And yeah, I felt like I had the opportunity that Boswell had to be up close. Do we get to know Johnson perfectly? No because he's a complex person. Steve is a man of many contradictions, as I said, and very complex. So I try to peel back the layer chapter after chapter. But he is a person who is a deeply intense and complex person. And I just try to let his story come across and let each reader try to analyze it. Yeah. Step to the here. Yeah. Mike? Sarujit Dudi, Mr. Walter, the way you described about Steve Jobs, you know, it's very passionate and very dedicated and hardworking. Why he ignored his cancer, he could have challenged it. And second, what he had a vision in future for products, what would have been in your future? Yeah, real quickly, why did he ignore his cancer? Well, he didn't. He tried those two different approaches, but as I said, for a few months, he's treating it macrobiotically. Steve had a focus. At times, if he didn't want to focus on something, he wouldn't do it. He would willfully just ignore something, whether it was a legal issue or a family issue or a cancer issue, 
That's just the way he was. It was like, I'm going to focus on what I want to focus on, and that's it. His vision for future products, I didn't put it all in the book because I don't want to prejudice Apple trying to create them, but he was trying to do for television what he had done for music, which is create an end-to-end -end system that would make it just as simple to watch television as it now is to consume music with iTunes, iTunes Store, and the iPod. I also think he would have wanted to disrupt the textbook industry, which is a brain-dead old industry of printing, you know, especially in the United States, huge expensive textbooks that the Texas School Board has to approve, as opposed to having really lively interactive products like Steve would have wanted to do on the iPad. Yes, beside that. Yeah, hi, I'm Prashant. I'm founder of a software company. I read your book twice, and so is many of my colleagues. And what I've seen is that people take that book as an excuse to be rude and rough to people around yeah. them. As an author, like, well, how do you feel about it? And yeah, it I feel bad that people read the book and say, oh, I'm like Steve. I'm rude to people, or I'm tough on people. I say, well, no, no. You may think anybody can be rude to people. There are a million people in this world who are rude and unkind, but they don't usually amount to much. They don't innovate. They don't inspire people. Steve, as I hope you saw in the book, besides being tough on people, inspires loyalty and gets people through his rudeness and reality distortion field to do things they thought were impossible. However, as I said, this is not a how-to manual on how to lead your life. This is a biography of a flesh and blood person who is not a perfect person. And you should not only say, let me learn the good parts about Steve Jobs and draw the lessons from the book, you should also draw the lessons from the bad parts of Steve Jobs. You do not have to be as unkind as he was at times in order to make great products. And, you know, if I were to write a novel about a wonderful person, I wouldn't have made it Steve Jobs. But I was just writing a biography about a flesh and blood human being who I happened to get to know very well, who had flaws as well as strengths, and I wanted to put all of those into context but not write a book that says, here's a how-to manual on how to succeed. Be just as rude as Steve was, and you'll create Apple Computer. Yes. Right there. Thank you, Mr. Walton, Walter, for coming to India. And my name is Vijay. Uh, how many months before or days before you stopped interacting with Steve before his death, and how was the, your signing off feeling at that point of time when you decided that it is... One of my last meetings with Steve Jobs is, you know, almost three or four weeks before he died. And he looked at me and he said, um, there'll be parts of this book I don't like. And I said, yeah, you're right, there will be. And he said, well, don't worry. I like you. I'm not going to read the book right away. I won't read it for another year. And he was very sick. And, you know, nobody... And I remember coming away caught by his reality distortion field. I walked into the garden, and I was elated because I said to myself, oh, Steve told me he's going to be alive in another year. That's great. So he was able, even at the end, to make people believe, as he said, I'll get to the next lily pad and beat this stage of the cancer. Yes. Thank you. Behind you, next to you. The mic's next to you. Mm. Sorry. Mr. Speaker, uh, my name is K.D. Madan. Uh, I wanted to know whether you have any plans or has there been any suggestion or request for you to uh, undertake a biography of Bill Gates, the rival of... Now, I, you know, Steve always said, stay hungry, stay foolish, try to do new things, reinvent yourself. You know, when I wrote a biography of Ben Franklin and it was successful enough in the United States, my publisher said, oh, great, let's find another founder. Why don't you do James Madison? And I thought, no, that would be just you know, getting into the rut, repeating myself. Likewise, when I did Einstein, I was like, oh, let's find another scientist. So I'm going to write about, I'm not even going to write a biography. My next book is a history of digital innovation and the really amazing innovators and creators of the digital revolution. Because, I, you know, if I just started, I, 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 you know, Bill Gates is a great unwritten book, and somebody will write a great biography of Bill Gates, but it ain't going to be me. So we have the last question here from the lady here. Uh, hi, uh, good evening. I'm Suchitra. Uh, I, I read somewhere that uh, uh, Steve Jobs wanted this book written so that his children could remember him and know all about him. So what was their opinion of the book? Yeah. Um, you know, that was a story. Somebody asked me why did Steve do it, and Steve never gave me a great explanation of why he was spending all this time talking to me. 
And I'd ask him a few times, I said, why are you opening up so much? You've not asked for any control over the book. You usually are very controlling. At one point, he said, well, my kids know me. And he gave a variety of different answers at different times. He said, I want it to be an honest book. I want it not to feel like an in-house book. I want it to be part of history. And I mentioned the thing about the kids, and it became part of an article. I'm not sure that was the main reason. I think, obviously, this is just a book about Steve Jobs. This book allows each person, I hope, and each reader to come to his or her own conclusion, to know what lessons, to know what to feel. I'm sure various people who knew him, various members of his family, various, he has four kids, he has, you know, wife, sister, daughter. Everybody probably has their, each has his own or her own reaction. I think that's the way biography is supposed to work. It's not supposed to preach at you and tell you, here's the way to live your life. It's just supposed to be a tale about one person's journey and what they learned along their journey. And each person's got to bring their own view, having read about that journey. Thank you all very much. Well, Thank you. Thank you, Walter, very much. Uh, really appreciate it. And as I mentioned, the book is available in the next room.